Okay, hello everybody. It's a great pleasure that I introduce you to your next uh, guest speaker of this uh, Central Asian Masterclass. So, um, I present to you Professor Scott Newton from SOAS, University of London. He is probably one of the only chairs of Central Asian law in the world. Yeah? And this with uh, a couple of decades of real experience. You wrote about, you've been studying law in Central Asia for so many years. I uh, remember you also writing about uh, the conflict in Tajikistan, right? Yeah, uh, among other things. Uh, so, uh, really, really looking forward to your lecture titled Network Governance and Perform uh, Perform Performativity. Yeah. Law, Constitutionalism. And you, you'll note this is actually not the title you were given, which I think was Law, di the Discourse and Practice in Law Across the Soviet, Post Soviet Divide, or something like that. Um, I, so th this is a, a much more specific topic. As a matter of fact, on the subject of topics, uh, I couldn't decide between this topic, um, which is lengthy and hard to pronounce, and this topic, which is pithier, right? The, the, the French expression, plus ça change, meaning the more things change, plus ça la même chose, the more things stay the same, the solved riddle of all Central Asian constitutions. You'll see why both of these titles um, Actually, all three of these titles are apropos. But since I couldn't decide among them, I've given you all three, all right, so apologies. All right, so what's the solved riddle of all Central Asian constitutions, right? So I take the term solved riddle of all constitutions from St. Carl, right? Um, and he posed a riddle in one of his early writings, right? Democracy is the solved riddle of all constitutions. Well, he posed the riddle and solved it at the same time, right? Here the Constitution not only in itself according to essence, but according to existence and actuality is returned to its real ground, actual man, the actual people, and established as its own work. The Constitution appears as what it is, the free product of men, right? So what Marx was saying is that in all forms of government prior to the advent of constitutions and constitutionalism, the real authors of the state, of the system of government were disguised. They conceal themselves on some specious grounds or other, whether by appeal to divine right um, or some other fiction, when in fact it was people who instituted a state, who put it together, who assembled it, who configured it. So the beauty of the, the, the advent of the age of constitutions is that you finally see what you get and get what you see, and states announce themselves as having been brought into being and set up in the first place and established by people. Now, as we go along here, and I pose a Central Asian riddle, you'll see that Marx's term, the actual people, um, is a bit more significant than Marx himself might have intended, intended, because we'll see that the actual people, when it comes to the Central Asian sta states, are not the people, the folk, but in fact, actual people. Um, the people who run the network. So here is the riddle in brief of Central Asian constitutions. Um, the more things change, the more they stay the same, right? So you heard yesterday, um, ably from Atrian, that there's been a constant ferment in Central Asian constitutions since the states were set up 25 years ago, there's been a, 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 an endless series of constitutional amendments, right? So here's Tajikistan, which underwent a civil war, and its amendments in 1999 were significant reconfiguration of the constitution on the basis of an internationally mediated peace agreement, right? Uzbekistan changes all the time. Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan had a new constitution in 1995, su sufficiently so that it's possible to speak of the first and second Kazakh republics, right, in Kyrgyzstan, which has ousted its president not once but twice, and is very much the regional anomaly, as Adrian also noted yesterday, in that the parliament, the Jorgu Knesh, throughout the history of Kyrgyzstan has been a very significant force, and Kyrgyzstan has a mixed parliamentary system, unlike the other states. Right, so here is a series of Kyrgyz constitutional amendments which win the sweepstakes by far. I mean, Kyrgyzstan gets the gold medal for constitutional amendment in the constitutional uh, amendment Olympics event because of the frequency and the significance of the amendment. So the 
Kierkegaard's constitutional amendments have very significantly changed the composition of the legislature of the Jagot Kuknesh. It began as a unicameral parliament. It was then transformed into a bicameral parliament. The nature of the constituencies was changed, was shifted from single member to proportional representation. It went back to unicameral. So there's been a very significant set of changes in Kyrgyzstan. Um, and a brand new constitution in 2010 after the ouster of Kurmanbek by Kiev. And even Turkmenistan has had a series of more or less significant constitutional amendments. Which, uh, Turkmenistan, which many, in many, res many respects remains the most staid and unchanging and solidly authoritarian, if not totalitarian, although that's a problematic term, as I'll have occasion to say later, of all of the states. Um, right, so uh, w w here is an example of a constitutional reform, a referendum, the referendum which brought in the latest changes in the Tajik constitution, which merely extended the term of the president. Um, now, a number of the constitutional amendments affect simply term limits. So um, they're very straightforward and fairly transparent. While the bulk of the amendments in not just in Tajikistan but elsewhere as well have to do with some more or less serious overhauling, re-engineering of the constitutional setup. Um, so y you'll note that amendments are brought in by referenda. That's not universally the case. There are instances in which amendments can be brought in without referenda, but by and large, the bu and that varies with the system, but by and large, the, the amendments have been brought in by referendum. And I want to flag referendum now, or plebiscite, um, because I'm going to return to the subject later. So this is basically a yay or nay vote. I mean, you can see in Tajik, right, ne or ha, yes or no. And that's basically the choice with which voters are presented. Now, I, referenda are a lot in the news these days. And I prefer to think of, uh, in the Central Asian case, as for that matter, in the general case, of amendments not as reforms, because that prejudges the case and that gives them more than, 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 uh, than they might deserve, and to talk rather of constitutional adjustments, of serial constitutional adjustments, rather than serial constitutional reforms, because reform tends to be overflogged and overestimated. Um, and it's too generous a term to bestow on processes which really involve constant going back and forth, shifts in the, in, the, in the arrangement of power, which are difficult to call reform or progress in any straightforward sense. So I prefer the term adjustment. Um, constitutional reform, legal reform, better constitutional adjustment, legal adjustment. Okay, so here's another referendum with which you might be familiar. Um, uh, referenda are all over the place these days, right? So here's the uh, a recent Australian referendum a couple of years back on same-sex marriage. Here's the Italian referendum from the same year um, as the Brexit referendum, which also sadly went the wrong way, at least in my view, and may in part have contributed to the current debacle in Italian politics, but that's for another lecture. Right, so, uh, so you see that this voting yay or nay um, has become quite popular, indeed populist. So I, I, I want you to bear that in mind as we go along here because I'm going to return um, later on to the subject of plebiscites and the significance of plebiscites in Central Asia. All right, so what, how are these systems set up? What's the physiognomy of the constitutional system? Right, what did they look like or the morphology, if you like? Um, well, for one thing, uh, these are all super-presidentialist states, with the exception of Kyrgyzstan, right? So th the president has overwhelming powers and indeed is considered, at least in the Kazakh constitution, as a fourth branch of government, a kind of meta-branch that sits above the other three branches. So this is basically the constitutional code or window dressing, if you like, for a, an authoritarian state. But in each of these states, the presidents, with the glaring exception of Kyrgyzstan, the president has overwhelming authority, has appointment powers to appoint um, and to sack, and generally has control over most of the workings of the state, including the other branches, right? So parliaments, the various parliaments, um, the Majlis in Kazakhstan, the Zhogokru Knesh in Kyrgyzstan, and the other parliaments 
um, have played, for the most part, a deferential and subordinate role, again, with the exception of the Jogoku Kanesh itself, which has emerged as a formidable rival to the president himself and the office of the president, or herself, um, in Kyrgyzstan. But for the most part, parliaments have been pretty pliable and compliant. They've been tools or instruments of the ruling authority, and that's not by accident, that's by design, that's by constitutional design. So parliaments, which obviously pose a certain set of challenges for any authoritarian government because parliaments might take a view different to the view of the executive, um, must be carefully managed, if not controlled. Um, we're missing the third branch of government here, um, the judiciary. And all of these states have enshrined the principle of separation of powers. They all look pretty familiar in the terms of their constitutional architecture, right? They look like they're straight um, out of Montesquieu with, with three branches of government which um, have diverse powers vis-a-vis -vis with one another. Um, judiciaries, by and large, have also been very pliant and compliant and subordinate and instruments of the ruling authority, even in those states like Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, which have developed a tradition of sophisticated constitutional jurisprudence. Not surprisingly, the outcome of most constitutional council or constitutional court or constitutional chamber decisions in which government interests are at play come out in favor of those interests. Right, so um, that is the a formal architecture, if you like, or the formal wiring, the formal setup of the constitutional arrangements in each of those states, and there are no surprises. Uh, the, the states look at least on superficial inspection as though they're pretty standard in terms of their constitutional circuitry. Um, but they don't tell you a lot except for issues like the overwhelming power of the presidency they don't, don't tell you a lot about the way in which power is actually configured or wired, how the systems really work. Um, and for that, you need to delve a little more deeply and you need to go beyond the Constitution. And I'm going to be borrowing from Henry Hale, a political scientist at American University, who has come up with the brilliant term patronalism or patronal politics as a way of capturing the specificities of virtually all of the post-Soviet regimes, right, which exhibit, notwithstanding the significant differences among them, certain outstanding commonalities. And he calls these systems patronal systems. So what's a patronal system? Okay, here's a patronal system. In a patronal system, um, there are a set of nested patron-client relations which are organized in a network. And at the apex sits the top figure in each political system, almost invariably the president. But the president is also the godfather of the network. So the president is simultaneously the holder of the public office, the chief public office, the chief executive, formal chief executive office, and at the same time, the informal chief executive office, because the president is simultaneously the head of the network. And it's the network that calls the shots. It's the network that runs the state. The net, what is a network? Okay, a network is an organization, an informal organization, the eligibility criteria for which may vary. I mean, uh, sometimes on the basis of fairly open recruitment, whoever comes to your awareness and demonstrates a willingness to play the game and a capacity to play the game can be adopted and nominated and taken as a member. Sometimes there are affective or kinship criteria but it's, I, I, I want to get away from exoticizing Central Asia and imagining that networks are necessarily kin-based because even when there are kinship criteria for membership, those criteria may well be fictive. They don't necessarily have to be kinship as such. Um, in any event, these organizations form or cohere or develop usually around one commanding personality on the basis of his, because it's invariably gender biased and the leaders of networks are invariably male, 
Um, and this leader of the network as a patron gathers around him multiple clients, clients who in their own right are patrons, patrons to their own clients. Right, so you get a, a, a setup at the end, a network of nested patron-client relationships. And it's the networks that, as I said, call the shots. They make the, 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 the basic allocation of the city. They have a kind of double or dual task because they have to govern themselves. And notwithstanding the fact that networks are regarded as a species of informal governance, they can be actually fairly well organized. They can effectively have an internal constitution, maybe not one that's written down, but there are rules that govern what you do, how much you can take, how much you can get away with, what you owe, and they're based ultimately on an economy of favors. So you do favors for your patron, your patron does favors for you, and exchange your favors down the line. And what's the point of all of this? Well, the point of all of this is to hold power and to acquire resources. Right, so the network's prime directive, if you want to think of Star Trek, is to stay alive and to stay in power. Um, and to garner resources, right? Resources which then can be distributed to the membership. So I said that the networks have a double burden of governance. They have to govern themselves, they have to keep everybody happy. Um, they have to keep everybody compensated. And they have to govern everyone else. They have to govern the society well, as well, since the, the, the circumstance of the wired power of network-based governance is such that you are able, by virtue of the public office you hold, to do the work you need to do for the network is obviously the governing work you need to do for everyone else. So, so, so uh, governing networks as a result, shown with this double burden, external governance and internal governance. Uh, now, this system is not unique to the Central Asian states, and Hale, as I said, has diagnosed this system across the entirety of the former Soviet Union, with the exception of the Baltics. Right, its origins um, arguably lie in, in Russia, um, Although the system grew up simultaneously, it's not as though uh, it's the Russian system that set the pace or set the model. But here is um, Balogia, and behind him is a pyramid. And you may have heard the term Kidanir, or Gidikal, vertical pyramid, which is another way of characterizing the system. They're not, um, not the, again, in the spirit of de exoticizing central Asia, and de exoticizing and de particularizing. Um, the, the, the former Soviet Union general, these systems are not unique to Central Asia. Indeed, the very term patronism suggests patronage, and patronalism um, is about the distribution of the spoils of office, or patronage, political patronage, and political patronage is, a, is a, as old as the hill. What we're dealing with in the case of these patronal networks are effectively political machines, political machines of the sort that were common in many supposedly advanced and respected places, right? So political machines ran most major municipalities in the U.S. until very late into the 20th century. The Tammany Hall with uh, the political machine in New York in the 19th century, the Daily Machine in Chicago in the 20th century. So political machines whereby uh, officials are elected to office on the basis of their promise to lavish the spoils of office on their constituents are common. What's uncommon in the Soviet, post Soviet context is the scale of this. Right? You can see we're not talking about municipalities, we're talking about entire polities and entire constitutional systems. Now, the other point to, to note about uh, paternalism and paternal networks is their dynamism, their turbulence, they're constantly in flux, in motion. And when uh, Adrian showed you the, 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 the changes, a series of changes, the electoral changes, the constitutional changes that I've just run through, with you, he said he called it instability. And I would call it metastability. There's a certain foreground flux and turbulence, but the system itself in the background endures, and that's effectively Hale's point that these systems are dynamic in their nature because there are always challenges to patrons. There are 
to challenges to the top patron, there are challenges to intermediate patrons, people jockey for position, people defect from one sub-network, one sub-patron to another, and the, the system, as a result, exhibit this superficial turbulence, which is reflected in legal changes, which is important because that should signal you straight away that networks have a significant investment in the legal system and the constitutional system. They don't govern in spite of the law, they govern through the law, that's the point. They manipulate the law. They make the Constitution work for them, and they write the Constitution. Okay, so um, that is, in a nutshell, um, a significant aspect of the solution to the middle of these constitutions. I'll return to that in very detail a little later on. Um, let me once again emphasize that these systems, this aspiration to function like these systems, is by no means unique to this part of the world. Um, And so there are there, there, there are many such um, political godfathers, and many wannabe political godfathers who simply lack the suitable environment for making this kind of a system work. Okay, um, where did all this come from? We're going to take a brief historical excursion uh, and go back in time um, to. The Soviet Constitution. Right, in June of 1936, uh, the Constitution, there were, there were at least four major Soviet Constitutions. Uh, 1918, 1923, 1918 was the Russian Socialist Federalist Soviet Republic, which was then the Union Constitution of 23. Then the amended, or the new Union Constitution, the Stalin Constitution. Thirty-six, and the Russian Constitution of seventy-seven. Um, but the most famous of the lot is the, the thirty-six Constitution, which is drafted by Ukraine, um and was you know, trumpeted back in the day as the, 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 the most advanced constitutional system in the world, not without a good reason. Um, right, so those of you who don't know Russia. Long live the leader of the nation, Ray Stalin, um, the creator of the Constitution, the victorious socialism, the defender of democracy. Okay, um, so what was up with the Soviet Constitution? There was a famous, I mean, book, a Soviet joke about the Constitution, uh, which involves a man. Now, I, I, I realize that uh, looking around the room, many of you are uh, a bit too young to have experienced dining in Soviet restaurants. I, I, I did that on many occasions. Um, but you usually sit there for a long time before you tap off the menu, and it's a mimeograph menu. And there's a joke about an elderly gent who goes into the cafe for lunch and waits for the little while until the waiters slowly go to the menu, and then gets the size of the and, 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 uh, He says, Well, that guy, please sit here. He makes a bush. Sweet, please. Um, I'll, I'll take boards, put more boards. Um, yep, you were right. Sorry, not on radio, we don't have it. We don't have it. Uh, what do you want? Move to the city. Okay, I'll have it. Have it soon. Yep. Well, why not? You were right. We don't have it. Move to uh, the Deshi. At which point, the guy, the patron, uh, takes off the glasses, looks up at her, and says, Oh, me, guy, at the me, the Constitution. Is this a menu or a constitution? All right, so that was generally the sense in which both people regarded the Soviet Constitution. Um, I, 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 I might take issue with that, although there's a German truth there. Rights in the Soviet Constitution, which were um, regarded as extraordinarily advanced in their elaboration of social rights, and people were not justiciable. Um, as well as the making The main intended decision. But nonetheless, I want to argue that 
um, for all the fun you can poke at it. The Soviet Constitution is, was actually one of the very few examples of radical constitutional novelty and experimentation in history. It was an entirely sui generis system. And these days, when you look at constitutional reform, and it's basically how many seats are PR and how many seats are con single constituency, you get one house, two house, you know, it's, it, 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 they're all uh, minor variations on the theme. But this was different. This was really different. So what was different about it? Let me just briefly introduce you to the Soviet Constitution. For one thing, it was Soviet, it was conciliar, what con meaning it was composed of councils. It was based on the principle of the council as the basic unit of government, I mean, in the form of the local council, right? So, uh, the, the indeed, the, 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 the one of the slogans of the revolution was all power to the Soviets, to the councils, which were workers' councils organized in factories to take control of, 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 of factory management, or at least to assume part of the burden of factory management. And the Bolsheviks, um, who initially were a bit diffident on the score of the councils, decided to adopt them as the basic unit of government, so much so that the whole state came to be called the council state, the conciliar state, the conciliar union, which is basically what the Soviet Union means in English. So it was a state premised on these councils as the, the unit of government. And they were arranged like matryoshka dolls, you know, in, 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 in a nested series, right? So he, the, the, the legislature, the parliament at the top was the Supreme Soviet, but there were town Soviets and region Soviets and rural Soviets councils, right? So councils up right up and down the line, all councils, all the time. Um, socialization of the means of production, right? So here was a state which the fir for the first time ever set out to own everything. There has never in history been a capitalist like the USSR, which held title to virtually the, entire, to vir uh, to virtually the entirety of um, the means of production, all infrastructure, factories, not just factories, not just industrial plant, agricultural plant, the land, the forest, the seas, etc. So no one has ever owned as much as the Soviet state, ever. Um, and not only was production socialized, except at the margins, I mean, there remained some artisanal and, 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 and uh, agricultural labor at the, at, at the margins. Everybody otherwise worked on, a basis, on the basis of wages for the state. So universal public wage labor, which was, again, an absolute novelty and was constitutionalized. Um, and not only was production socialized, but so was social life in general. And, and everyone had an extraordinary array of benefits right, from um, the standard insurance and health services. By the way, the, the, the English, uh, the British National Health Service is modeled on the Simashko Soviet single provider, um, single payer health system. They invented this. And I, as some of you no doubt are familiar with a generous scheme for maternal support, creches, um, recreation, resorts, etc. right? All on the basis of five-year plans. So state planning um, was absolutely fundamental to this operation. People lived and died by the plan. Um, this, the, 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 the scheme that the Soviets devised, the Soviet, uh, socialist scheme, was moreover internationalist. Right, it emerged from an international movement, the second international, the, the socialist movement, which was international in its fundamental aspiration. It aspired to a worldwide revolution. And indeed, once socialism triumphed in Russia, Moscow then became the home of the third international or the Comintern. So from its, out, from, from, from its dawn, it was international. And it constitutionalized a form of internationality. In other words, it set itself up as a model world state, as a federation, um, under the leadership of the great Stalin forward to communism. Um, the Soviet Union, once the Union Federation formula was worked out, and that took some time, that took a few years, um, was a kind of model for the world insofar as in one state were contained multiple subordinate jurisdictions which enjoyed notional autonomy and for the union of public's sovereignty, which represented dif different nationalities. So this was a microcosm. This was the world in miniature. 
And indeed, that was the point. So beyond the internationalist inspiration um, of the, 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 the revolution, it enshrined constitutionally, it constitutionalized a form of internationality in a multinational federation based on nationalities and autonomies, right? So on the one hand were the sundry official nationalities which involved according legal status, juridifying effectively ethnicity or culture. And those of you who are familiar with Soviet nationalities policy will know that the number of nationalities fluctuated over time very significantly in the waning years of the Soviet Union. I think there were 170 something official nationalities uh, every census, when the, when the census was taken periodically, you would have to tick the box for your nationality and the number of boxes, which was obviously a, an important um, political as well as uh, legal determination, uh, w w would reflect the, the number of official nationalities. So, for instance, and uh, this didn't correspond to people's identities or, 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 or self-understanding, so in, in Georgia, for instance, Mingrelians were never recognized as a separate nationality, even though they spoke a distinct language, and they were always classified as Georgians for census purposes. Um, so as, as I said, the, the, the number of, of, of nationalities would, would, would fluctuate and diminish with changes and shifts in policy. Nationality was figured, national, was, 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 was figured on famous point five of the passport, so everyone carried around with them this evidence of their official juridical ethnicity. Um, and that was one half of the scheme, and the other half of the scheme was, of course, was of course ethno territorial federalism. The Bolsheviks inherited this extraordinary Eurasian landmass, this overland Romanov Empire, which was distinct from overseas empires because it placed into contiguity with one another a very few dominant European peoples and sundry non-European peoples who were not divided by a sea but part of the same landmass. And this presented the Bolsheviks with something of a challenge because they wanted to preserve this empire in its territorial extent but to de-imperialize it. And hence arose the idea of making a virtue of, an, of necessity and converting an empire into a world state, a world socialist state. A model for the eventual triumph of the worldwide socialist revolution, right? And th this scheme of ethno-territorial federalism was premised on autonomies, as they're called. That is, autonomous jurisdictions of which there were four the Union Republic, the Autonomous Republic, the Autonomous Province, and the Autonomous Okrug or area. Um, and these were arranged like Matryoshka dolls, save for the fact that the vast bulk of the lesser autonomies was concentrated in the RSFSR, the Russian Republic, which was itself a federation. So if you uh, want to think about it, then indeed when the Soviet Union was formed, it was formed by a, an agreement, a treaty, among the Transcaucasus Federation, which consisted of Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan, and Georgia in turn was a federation of Abkhazia and Georgia, Belarus, um, Ukraine, and the Russian Federation. So the, the whole thing was multiply federated, and the idea of splitting um, jurisdictions was essential and, and a fundamental part of the whole scheme. Right, and what this resulted in over time was the creation of proto-nations, right, who were kitted out, who were equipped with an entire apparatus of cultural production and expression, right, from museums and orchestras, um, philharmonics, um, operas, art galleries, right, with Kazakhstan at the top, Uzbekistan, national theaters, etc., with a canons of national literature, this is a history of, of Uzbek Soviet literature, um, and canons of official writers. Um, I, while we're on the subject of Uzbekistan and the Uzbek language, the Uzbek language and indeed the Uzbek nation are to some extent artifacts of a constitutional process. Since the term Uzbek had not been in general circulation since the 17th century and was resurrected and reanimated both by Uzbek nationalists and by the Soviets, the Bolsheviks, as a way of, for di very different reasons, 
for an instilling and implanting a national consciousness and developing a national culture. And they were simultaneously proto-states because they were kitted out with an entire institutional apparatus of government. They had constitutions, Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan, the Uzbek and Kazakh SSR, Soviet Socialist Republics. Um, they had parliaments. Right. Um, they had Supreme Courts, that's the Tajik Parliament, the Supreme Soviet and the, and, and the Kazakh SSR Supreme Court back in the day. Um, and how was all of this achieved? This was achieved by a process of national delimitation. Right. So on what basis were these autonomies assigned and on what basis were they graded? So how did you rank, how did you merit a uh, Union Republic of which they were originally um, just four, and how did you get assigned to an autonomous area, for instance, as opposed <coughs> to an autonomous province? Um, how did you get entitled to an autonomous jurisdiction at all, to an autonomy? Because there were many more nationalities than there were autonomous jurisdictions. Right, so, uh, for instance, and that created certain anomalies. So the Jewish population, was, which was significant at the, at the time, although, albeit for the most part confined to the Pale of Settlement, <coughs> in the Western Romanov Empire was a headache for all sorts of reasons. Um, and eventually, Stalin decided that they needed an autonomy, an autonomous jurisdiction of their own so that they weren't this floating cosmopolitan elite. And they were given uh, Birobijan, a chunk of territory in Siberia. Um, so this is, a, this is the commissariat. This was the commissariat of nationalities. Uh, where this work was undertaken in the 20s, and here's the commissar himself, right? Um, he's the chap who did this delimitation. He's the one who drew the lines on the map. This was his speciality, his metier, um, long before he rose to higher office. Um, and you can witness this process of um, SU enlargement, right? Soviet Union enlargement, along the lines of EU enlargement. Um, right, so here's a, 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 an early map of the Soviet Union with the, respectively, the Armenian, uh, Azeri, uh, Belarusian, Russian, Georgian, and Ukrainian republics, right? And here we are a few years later with everybody else, okay? So how did we get all of these additional Union republics? That, well, that was thanks to him. Um, this didn't all happen at once, right? And in the course of Central Asia, this took quite some time, right? From the, 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 the inherited uh, Tsarist gubernias of Turkestan, which covered most of Central Asia apart from Kazakhstan, um, were ultimately carved out um, the existing Central Asian republics uh, and the uh, inherited Romanov mistake in nomenclature was corrected since for some reason uh, the early Russian officials insisted on calling the Cossacks Kyrgyz, um, and they didn't appreciate the distinction between Kyrgyz and Cossacks sufficiently until significantly later on. Right? So the, the, the Kyrgyz, i.e. Cossack Autonomous Republic, was sub subsequently subdivided into Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, and then the Turkestan Republic, apart from the Bukharan and Kharezm um, republics, was then further subdivided into the, uh, into the other three contemporary republics, right? So um, what that meant, and what I want to emphasize here, is that the Central Asian states are probably the uni are unique cases of constitutional artifacts of, somebody's in of somebody else's internal constitution-making process. Whether that's a cause for celebration or not, it remains the case. The Central Asian states are artifacts of constitution making in all respects. Okay, now I, I'll, I'll, I'll just throw that bomb out now. I'll, I'll be happy to defend it later, but I want to move us on here. Okay, I, what else do you need to know about the Soviet constitutional system? Okay, this was not in the original constitution, the significance of the party, um, and only came to be officially acknowledged and constitutionalized in the Brezhnev constitution. but. The Communist Party the, of the Soviet Union, as it came to be called, or the, 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 the all-Russian Communist Party, parenthesis, Bolsheviks, Sierra Siske Communistische Partie, 
Skopkoch Bolsheviki, which was the original name of the thing, um, played an extraordinary and unique role in the constituent process here. It was the guarantor of the constitutional arrangements. It was the author of the constitution. In some sense, it was the constituent power, the pouvoir constituant of the whole thing. And it remained in place. Right, so it, and, and, it, and, and, and this is um, particularly significant here, but what, because what developed was a system of parallel lines or parallel governance here with uh, apologies to Deborah Harry. Anyone who recognizes her gets a point. Um, you, may, you may know that uh, I, I made reference to, to Lenin's incorporation or, 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 or harnessing um, or domestication of the, the councils, the Soviets, which gave rise to this, the phenomenon of, of, of dvoya vlastia, right, of, of, of double governance. Uh, the councils on the one hand and the official organs of, of, of state on the other. Well, this double governance scheme, Dvoya Vlastia, in its mature form, was effectively a division of power, or rather a duplication of power, between um, the organs of, formal organs of government, the councils, the ministries um, on the one hand, and all of the formal apparatus of government, the constitutional apparatus of government, judicial, legislative, and ex executive, on the one hand, and the party on the other, right? Because the party shadowed, duplicated, the functions of everyone else. So there were party secretaries and party officials and party representatives assigned to and managing and instructing, effectively, the workings of every other unit of government, from factories to local councils to courts, um, so here at the top is a meeting of the, 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 the Kabmin, the cabinet of ministers in late Soviet times. And underneath is a meeting of the Politburo, the Politburo, which was the, it sat at the apex of the central committee, which sat at the apex of the party, was the chief governing um, unit of the party, headed by the general secretary, who was the general secretary of the party. Um, which, by the way, was a, was, was a role, was initially just a secretarial role, but the, 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 the person who in developed that role of general secretary into something much more powerful was the same chap who was the commissar of nationality. So that's the way in which general secretary came to be this all-powerful office in the scheme. Right, so, um, so there you have the, 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 the cabinet of ministers at the top and the Politburo. And effectively, the cabinet of ministers took its instructions from the Politburo, and so on down the line. So the party apparatus was effectively a network, the original network, which was disseminated everywhere. So the Soviet Union, in some sense, was the original network-based governance system. Although the role of the party was not constitutionalized in, until 1977, nonetheless, it functioned, and unlike any other party, as this ongoing guarantor and monitor and supervisor and controller of the constitutional system and indeed of the operation of day-to-day -day government and the setting of policy, right, which is an absolutely unique arrangement. Now, the Soviet Union was massively networked and the, and the COP SS may have been the primary network, the chief network, but there were all sorts of other networks. The place was massively networked. Um, and part of the reason for that was the significance of informality and informal associations generally. But there were legal networks, there were in illegal networks, there were black market networks, there were Vodiv uh, Zakonya networks, the, the, the organized crime networks in the prisons. Um, there were networks on the basis of you know, service in the Soviet military or the submarine fleet. Um, and people who graduated from, from, from Sakursniki, who graduated from the same institution, the whole place was full of networks. So there are networks all over the place. And this one grand network of the COP SS. And of course, another distinguishing feature of this constitutional system was its ideology, its Marxism Leninism, which was extraordinarily powerful and extraordinarily visionary and comprehensive. Um, and this was an ideology which essentially reflected multiple simultaneous projects, a political project, an economic project, a social project, 
a psychological project, a, spirit a spiritual project, um, the whole idea was to bring into being an entirely new form of society over time. This is also the original transitional constitution because socialism was always conceived as transitional to the eventual stage of communism, right, which lay there at somewhere at the end of the rainbow, but which meant that not only was this uh, uh, the, the, the first species, if you like, a first example of transitional constitutionalism, but it was transitional moreover in the sense that constitutionalism and constitutions were themselves understood as merely transitional. Because at the end of the rainbow, you know, um, when, when, when communism would be achieved, there would be no need for a formal architecture of governance in this way. So there was a kind of provisional interim quality to the entire scheme, however elaborate it was, at least ideologically. This was also a legal project. It was a cultural project for the simultaneous cultural development of the multiple nationalities and nations of the Soviet Union. It was a project of economic development, of socialization, of cross-development, since the more developed parts of the Union were duty-bound to assist and civilize and develop the less advanced parts of the Soviet Union. Indeed, this question of advanced and backward was integral to the way in which the Soviets conceived the juridification and the regulation of culture. So in the process of national delimitation, the criteria that Stalin used in order to determine who got what were civilizational criteria, at least in the eyes of, 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 of the Bolsheviks, that is, presumed distance or remoteness from some European ideal or standard of civilization, which was a frankly colonialist idea, although not acknowledged as colonialist. Indeed, it was understood to be anti-colonialist. But the, the, this, this idea of a ranking or scale of civilizations was very much part and parcel of Bolshevik thinking. And one's, the, the place of one's nation in a kind of civilization or, or cultural hierarchy or ranking was an important determinant of the status you got. Um, as were all sorts of other considerations such as your demography, your, the concentration of your population, um, your numbers, um, your political reliability. There was this complex calculus which Stalin used and which was a shifting calculus so it changed over time. So you might get promoted, you might get demoted, right? The, the Volga Germans got unceremoniously and very quickly demoted from a national republic and indeed from a recognized nationality after the outbreak of hostilities after the German invasion in World War II. And there are multiple other instances where uh, the, the state of an, autonom of an autonomy might be elevated. For instance, uh, the, Tajik autonomous air, the Tajik Autonomous Republic, which was within Uzbekistan, was ultimately <laughs> elevated to the status of a full-blown Union Republic, largely in compensation for the loss of the Tajik-speaking areas of Samarkand and Bukhara to Uzbekistan. So this process of rearrangement of the, 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 the ethno-territorial system um, was constant, as was the rearrangement of nationalities. This was a system that was itself always in flux. Um, so uh, the, 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 the Marxist-Leninist ideology, as I said, contemplated this multiplicity of projects. And the Soviet Union can be understood as, in many ways, the grandest and most ambitious political project of all time, political, social, cultural, and legal. OK, let me emphasize this was a simultaneously a legal project because Pending the advent of communism, there was no choice but to work through law. And that was a decision made early on. Right, so however radical the scheme was in other respects, it remained a legal constitutional scheme. And law was going to be the idiom of public authority. And moreover, it was going to be the way in which public authority was constituted in the first place. Right, so here arrived socialist legality or socialist constitutionalism, state and law was the preferred term for constitutionalism in Soviet terminology, right? So here's Montesquieu, and here's Montesquieu Bolshevized, which is, which is essentially what happened, right? So Lenin, who, as you may be aware, spent 
couple of decades as a labor lawyer, <coughs> was a trained lawyer, um, was among the, the most ardent in his chastisement of infantile leftism in the early years of, of, of the Soviet Union, when it was or the early years of the um, Russian Soviet Republic, when it was imagined that law could be dispensed with. And there was a lot of zeal for just doing away with law and replacing it with some kind of system of direct <laughs> socialist command. And Lenin said, we're not having that. That's not on. Um, and in 1922, he faithfully commissioned his jurist to go copy the Swiss Civil Code, with which he was familiar, having <laughs> lived in Geneva for many years. And the Swiss, this sort of knockoff of the Swiss Civil Code became the first civil code of the RSFSR. And in far from being a temporary measure for the, the new economic policy, the NEP came to be the bedrock of the Soviet legal system, right? So socialist legality was the doctrine that eventually was espoused by Wyszynski, um, the procurator general, then the minister of justice, then the ambassador to the UN, very prominent, Stalin's lawyer, basically, Stalin's fixer, Wyszynski. Um, so you can see this I, as a case of either Bolshevizing Montesquieu, but it worked over time in the opposite direction as well. Um, and that's the problem when you adopt law as your idiom of governance and it, as the basic substance out of which you're going to fashion your constitutional system. You live by it and you die by it. And that's the nature of the law. Because once you're committed to law, you're committed to legal logic and legal rationality. And legal forms can <coughs> often be used in unexpected ways, and they can be used against their authors. And indeed, that's the history of the demise of the Soviet Union, the revenge of the forms, when the individual notionally sovereign constituent union republics actually asserted their sovereignty um, and withdrew from the union, and the union collapsed. OK. Now, uh, law was very much an instrument or a tool of rule. So there was very instrumentalist character to law. That is, the Bolsheviks ruled through law. Um, and this gave rise to a set of fairly challenging complexities and contradictions which characterized the Soviet system. Right? So on the one hand, it was indisputably formalist. Right? The Soviet court is the court of the people. Um, and there was nothing about the way in which people were trained in the law um, and about the books they used, which radically distinguished Soviet law from any other contemporaneous civilian tradition. I mean, Soviet law was Romanist law. And Soviet civil law was Romanist civilism. And all of the concepts and forms were borrowed or inherited from the ultimately Germanic Russian civil law system, which the Soviets basically changed the label on. And they added a few socialist tweaks but by and large, the, Russia, the Soviet legal system was very recognizably a civilian-originated system and not terribly distinct from its contemporaneous civilian system. So formalism, the formalism of substance and the formalism of procedure, um, once embraced, and the, 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 there was a very robust tradition of, ro of, of, of Russian um, formalism once that was adopted and embraced, it endured. But it was mixed with anti-formalism, um, which is the recourse, notwithstanding the published norms, to extra normative considerations like revolutionary justice in order to decide an outcome. So that's the dispensing with general norms and the um, invocation and the use of uh, of, 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 of uh, conditions um, and circumstances which are thoroughly particular. Right? So instead of applying general rules, you devise a decision on in, in the instant, right? a, a form of Qadi justice at the extreme, where you just make a decision. And anti-formalism, that is, taking a decision notwithstanding the norm, but in the interest of some overriding consideration like socialist justice or class justice, um, or, 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 or uh, eradicating um, betrayal and punishing enemies was a constant feature of the system. And indeed, the recourse to administrative measures, which was characteristic of 
large-scale instances of political repression like decolonization and collectivization, and then the political repressions, the great terror of the 30s, um, often involved going outside and beyond um, and contrary to published norms. But I don't want to exaggerate the significance of anti-formalism because even at the height of the terror, um, there was a significant observance of formalism, right? So the troikas, the, 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 which were um, especially convened boards with representatives from the procuracy, the, in, the internal affairs ministry, the commissariat, the NKVD, and the party, which would basically um, adjudicate the cases of, 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 of uh, the, the, the criminal cases of espionage, sabotage, anti-Soviet behavior, etc., which were the substance of, of the purges, um, these boards maintained a protocol. There was a, and there was, a st there was a statute which authorized their formation in the first place. So even at the height of the excesses of the purges in the 30s, there was some due regard for formalism. Um, and beyond formalism and anti-formalism, to complete this picture, was informality, which was rampant. Because this system was so extraordinarily exacting and rigorous that it required a significant degree of informal um, manipulation and softening and greasing in order to work at all. So everybody tried to beat the system or get around the system in one way or another, everywhere. Okay, so here's a, 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 a somebody, the tout, who's selling tickets, um, and this is a, you know, this is a, a, by way of condemnation of this kind of behavior, but these people were all over the place. There were the farsoshiki, the black marketeers, um, there were the tolkachi, the pushers, the brokers, basically, who would mix, who would help state enterprises by finding sources for difficult to find materials, etc. So these people were all over the place. The Soviet Union was rife with informal actors who would help the system function. So informality was essential to the functioning of the Soviet system and you got this crazy amalgam, unique in history, of hyperformalism, anti-formalism, informality, all rolled into one. So that makes it very difficult to characterize the nature of legality, of socialist legality in practice as opposed to in, in, in ideology. Because in practice, socialist legality was a compound of all these things. Um, and finally, performativity. Okay, this is a book that some of you may have seen by Alexei Yurchak, um, which talks about the significance of performance in the late Soviet Union. The way in which multiple aspects of life were reduced to ritual performances. Um, so voting, for instance, which was by plebiscite, right? So uh, voting in the Soviet Union was, I, I mean, it's typically written off as a, 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 a phony or staged exercise. It wasn't, it was a plebiscite. You, you either voted, you checked the candidates on the, on the ballot paper or you didn't. So you have effectively voted yes or no. You were presented with the terms of a decision which had been fixed elsewhere. Now I want to suggest as we go along here that plebiscites is not, are not as singular and unusual as one might suppose. And that this kind of yay or nay voting, that is basically approving or disapproving the terms of a choice that someone else has made, and you can think about plebiscite in those terms, is actually characteristic of a much wider range of voting. Um, but uh, voting in, 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 in Soviet times was purely performative, right? You know, uh, for the further flourishing of, of, of the socialist motherland. Um, you know, this was part of your citizen's duty. And indeed, many aspects of official life, um, official social life, in the Soviet Union acquired this performative character. That is, you would do them without really believing in them because you were, it was expected. Um, so here's Komsomol, right, so membership in Komsomol was, and participation in Komsomol activities, the Young Communist League was similarly ritualized, um, as indeed was, you know, this is the Supreme Soviet voting on the, the, the 1977 Brezhnev Constitution, right, so I, uh, legislation was performative, voting was performative, and to, the, the legal system in many aspects was performative. Right. So the significance was not in the substance, 
not in uh, the content of what you were doing, but in the fact of doing it. So you were, and Yurchak says, this basically enabled the Soviet Union to function and left everybody you know, perfectly happy because all they had to do was perform these rituals and instead, and in, in return they got all of these benefits from the state and you know, generally enjoyed life. And it was a flourishing intellectual life um, intellectual and social and cultural life in late Soviet times, which was a function of this performativity. Now, I, I want to interpret this in a, in, in a broader way, um, because you can, you can argue that the Soviet Union itself was a gigantic collective performance. It was a production of its citizens and the state. And no state before had demanded so much in the way of performativity on the part of its civ citizens. It had to be enacted. And I think I, that's a much more interesting sort of ethnographic way of understanding the, the, the Soviet Union than totalitarianism. But it wasn't, uh, it, it, it was a project, it was a collective project and it was a collective production in which everyone had a role, a scripted role, and in which everyone was called upon to perform. So this was massively high maintenance. I mean, nobody has ever come up with as high maintenance a state as this one, since it required this constant daily performativity, right? So here, th this is uh, Renan, the French thinker of the 19th century, who famously said that a nation, what is a nation? A nation is a plebiscite, a daily plebiscite, a daily referendum. Um, the idea that a, a nation has to will itself into, built into being and that every day you have to tell yourself you're French, um, as the case, as his case, um, would have it in order to be French. That the French nation only comes into existence as a result of this collective will. And this will has to be renewed every day. Um, well, we can press Renan into service here and recognize that this theory of a plebiscite of every day um, was characteristic of the Soviet Union. It was not just a plebiscite of every day, it was a performance of every day, a ritual of every day. The Soviet Union had constantly to perform itself, to enact itself, and that was part of the quality of Sovietism, of Soviet stateness. It was a collective performance. Um, all right. Skip forward to Perestroika, the end of this experiment, right? Perestroika is a revolution, right? So reconstruction was supposed to be revolutionary. This was the first time this system was going to be re-engineered and the constitutional architecture was going to be re-engineered as well. So those of you, um, uh, those of you who are aware of this um, will understand that one of Gorbachev's many ideas here, um, right, Skarinia, acceleration, democratization, democratization, glasnost, transparency, one of, one of his ideas was refounding the Soviet Union as a union of sovereign republics. Um, so, I, th and in the very late stages of, of his rule, and the last twilight days of the Soviet Union, a, a reconstitution process was underway, not only for the Union, but for the constituent republic. So everybody was busy, there was a parade of sovereignties, everybody was declaring sovereignty, um, and everybody was busy um, reconstituting. Now, Gorbachev came by that idea, honestly, and a lot of the, 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 the revolution in Piedestroika was a legal revolution. So just as Socialism was a legal project as well as a political project and a, an economic project, etc. So was Pietrosroika. The reconstruction of socialism was a legal project because Gorbachev was a lawyer. Okay, so the first and last leaders of this high maintenance state um, were both lawyers, and law was the medium of this state's construction, operation, and reconstruction. Um, so Gorbachev launches a constitutional pro process and a reform process, a reconstruction process, which ends abruptly. And as a result, the Central Asian states are born as states by caesarean, effectively. Okay, they are, they're n not only are they artifacts of the Soviet constitution in the first place, but they come into being as independent republics by way of this interruption of a constitutional reform process. Right, so they're constitutional all over, all, you know, from top to bottom. Um, and I, 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 I said before that when you embrace law, you know, you live by it, you die by it. Um, 
the, the, the constitutional architecture of the Soviet Union was its undoing um, and a spectacular revenge of the forms because Boris Yeltsin was, among other things, a, 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 a chancer, um, you know, a, 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 uh, a gambler, who spotted the same flaw in the constitutional arrangements that Stalin had. Stalin and Lenin had a fight about it, or how to organize the Soviet Union because Stalin wanted to, didn't want to create all of these additional Union republics. He simply wanted to expand the Russian Soviet Federated Socialist Republic. And Lenin said, no, we have to have separate Union republics. And the result was this completely asymmetric arrangement where you had a gigantic Russian republic with all these mini republics inside the micro republics. And then the, 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 the fringed by the peripheral Union republics, which are much smaller in area and population. Well, the, 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 the national cultural apparatus of the Russian Republic was always undeveloped. So both the Russian Republic was neither a proto-state nor a proto-nation, and the governance, both the governance structure and the cultural apparatus of the Russian Republic were very feebly developed in comparison to the other republics. And Yeltsin saw a way to exploit that as a clever constitutionalist, and he effectively um, reanimated and rapidly developed both the governance structures and the national structures of the Russian Republic. And the Soviet Union was then eaten away from inside constitutionally when the Russian Republic asserted its constitutional preferences and privileges and prerogatives. Okay, so that, and, and that in effect led to this untimely birth. Okay, what I want to do now um, briefly is tell you a bit about the way in which law actually works. Um, because we've been looking at legality in the context of the Soviet Union and invariably when you look at law and socialist legality in this way, it comes to seem exotic and anomalous and exceptional. Um, and I want to try to de-exceptionalize that with you and, and get you to understand that what the Soviets did with law is what law basically offers itself to anyone who has the, you know, the, the nous and the capacity and the will um, to play with. So law comes to you with these possibilities for further development. These are things you can do with law and the Soviets did them. So, I, w what I want to do now briefly is to contextualize law for you and to remind you that law is a social system right? and to approach law from the perspective of a sociologist and to understand that law in order to work, obviously law has its own interiority, it has its own logic, it has its own rationality, but it's embedded in society and it has a particular relation to, the f to informality. So if you want to think about the relation between the formal legal institutional system and informal practices. You need to conceive of them in this kind of yin-yang way. Formality is always, is always inside and always bounds informality. Informality is always inside and bounding formality. Right, so the formal system never tells you how to apply itself or in, what, in respect of what circumstances. Or if it does purport to do that, then the application of the law is invariably influenced by intervening factors, background factors, social factors, in biographical factors, informal factors. So the formal system is never sufficiently formal. And whether it's a matter of prosecuting a criminal case or deciding to prosecute, investigating a case, or suing on a contract, um, there's always uh, an element of um, social identity, social values, which have nothing in particular to do with the norms which influence the decision in the particular case. Informality itself is never entirely informal and there's a good deal of structure to informality. So the informal governing networks that I've been referring to in Central Asia and elsewhere in the former Soviet Union have a, an internal structure. They are effectively constitutionalized. They might not have a written constitution um, and they might not have the degree of extreme elaborate articulation that the Communist Party did, but they're nonetheless organized. Right? So informality can be organized and the informal networks that we look at are not simply a matter of informal practices, but of organized informality. 
um, interpretation, right? So the law never tells you how it's to be applied. For that, you need to develop some sense of the allowable remit of interpretation. Um, and that even in civil law systems where supposedly the codes tell you exact, instruct you exactly how to apply the norms in respect of which circumstances, in practice, it's a social practice and it invariably is influenced and impacted by social factors. So lawyers argue, even in civilian systems. Um, they argue with one another, they argue with judges. They don't apply the rules they bend the rules, they manipulate the rules. That's why there are lawyers, okay? So what you need to do when you look at the way law works um, in Central Asia as in any other place is that you need to look through it not with a layman's eye, but with a professional's eye, right? So not what is this law going to do, but how do I work this law? How do I make it work for me? How do I apply it? Right? That's what a lawyer thinks when a lawyer looks at a law, not what, what am I supposed to do, how do I obey this, but how can I show that I'm in compliance with this, or how can I use this to advance my purpose or my client's interests. Okay, so lawyers are expert manipulators of rules. That's what they are. They manipulate rules. Um, and that's the way law works. Law is a system of rule manipulation. Okay, and moreover, Law is all about bargaining, because people bargain within the law, so the law gives you certain rights, and on the basis of those rights, you bargain with other people. So here's an example of collective bargaining. Labor sits on one side, management sits on the other, but they bargain on the basis of the rights that they have by virtue um, of statute. Now, law is also a system of power, so the rights are unequal, and the bargaining power that people bring to bargaining within the law, and it may be, you know, bargaining in the context of a matrimonial dispute, of a divorce proceeding, but you're still bargaining on the basis of the law. Um, and you bring to the bargaining table whatever power that you derive by virtue of, 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 of um, the applicable law, and you then argue. So you argue about you know, who gets rights to what, you argue about you know, uh, length of the working day, overtime pay, etc. You, you argue about who gets the kids. Um, that's bargaining. And if there's bargaining within the law, and that's endemic to all systems, so all the law does is basically set up a framework for manipulation on the one hand and bargaining. Um, and those go together. Right? Those are not mutually exclusive activities. And if you bargain within the law, you also bargain about the law. You bargain for changes in the law. And that's called lobbying, okay? And it's a form of bargaining, the application of pressure, right, in order to get something enacted. And you see lobbying at all scales, um, from the most trivial to the constitutional, right? So here's, you know, here's lobbying for a constitutional amendment, right? This is the U.S., the repeal of prohibition, the Volstead Act in 1933, which is an act, a constitutional amendment that banned alcohol. Um, that was adopted in the 20s, and uh, then there was a, a movement to repeal that amendment with a sub subsequent amendment. So these are the kinds of things that Americans get excited about, right, beer. Um, but I, th they're not invariably trivial, so here's the m Equal Rights Amendment movement uh, to, to, to enshrine constitutionalized gender rights in the U.S. Constitution, uh, which continues to be a vain hope. Um, that's lobbying for constitutional change. So we can see that bargaining and manipulation and the impossibility of distinguishing and delineating informality and formality because they, they're mutually constitutive and co-determining is characteristic of all systems in which the law operates, not just Soviet and post-Soviet systems. Moreover, um, all legal systems contemplate a hierarchy of rules and at the top there are so-called meta-rules that, that's the constitutional framework, which is supposed to determine the way everything else works. And those are much harder to change. That's why you need an amendment process, which generally requires a great deal of investment. Um, so the, the meta rules are supposed to reflect meta politics, right? Not ordinary politics, but agreement about the basic rules of the game, um, the framework for the political system itself. 
Now, it, it, French actually has two terms for politics, right? It has la politique, which means politics in the sense of the to and fro, and the bargaining of politics. And it has le politique, which in English would, is, is translated the political, meaning the set of enabling conditions for any kind of politics to happen in the first place. And you can think of constitutions as an attempt for the first time to try to capture and write down and memorialize uh, le politique, the political. Now the idea, of course, is that this zone of meta-politics or, 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 or le politique is not supposed to be subject to the same kinds of intense pressures um, and tactics as ordinary politics. But I want to, and indeed constitutional scholars imagine that you know, when it comes to writing constitutions, you somehow leave politics at the door, which is manifestly not the case, right? So there's the idea that, you know, lawmaking itself, um, I don't, I won't name the jurisdiction uh, here, but it's close. Um, it's in the vicinity. Uh, so so it, it's not in Central Asia, okay. But, so I, ordinary politics, right, in the context of ordinarily, ordinary lawmaking can be quite feisty, not to say combative, right? But, but we somehow expect that meta lawmaking, and this is Philadelphia, 1787, right, meta lawmaking is supposed to be Olympian, right? So, um, you know, and everybody is, 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 is formally attired and, and, and conducts himself, and once again, this was thoroughly gendered, um, in an appropriate manner that this, you're, you're, you're planning for posterity for the ages, right? This is, you know, the, 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 uh, if you look at an American banknote, it says, novus ordo secularum, you know, a new order for the centuries, which actually was more appropriate for the Soviet constitution, but they didn't emblazon a Latin inscription. Um, an entirely new order, a new dispensation, right? So that's what these guys imagined that they were creating. Um, and of course, we all know that, you know, ordinary politics was all over the place in Philadelphia, and the whole thing was a function of bargaining between slaveholding states and non-slave states, and we wouldn't have Trump as president of the U.S. if it hadn't been for these unsavory compromises, because there wouldn't be an electoral college, um, there wouldn't be a Senate, and there wouldn't have been all of these other fundamental components of the American constitutional arrangement, which basically reflect the significance of the slaveholding interests in 1787, right? So why is Trump president slavery, in short? Um, okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll take up that point later, right? So, so what is, when we look at, at Central Asia, what does meta-lawmaking look, look like? Well, here's the working group for the latest set of the Kazakh constitutional amendments, and you can see that it's chaired by the man himself, Papa, um, who has assembled this working group, right? So, you know, you, you, you can do the maths and understand that this is intensely political. And indeed, uh, the, the relationship between networks and constitutions is a very close one. So I want to um, pick up on that theme. Um, if we go back now to our five Central Asian cases, and we visit them now, understanding what we now know, I just told you, what you can take for your further consideration, which you now know provisionally, you know, might be prepared to accept upon reflection, about the nature of the Soviet constitutional system and the function of law in the Soviet state on the one hand, um, and on the other hand, all of the things you can do with law that law enables you to, to do once you understand law as a social system. Okay, so um, what role does law play in the consolidation and the operation of the Central Asian state? So let's put the same questions that we as answered with respect to the Soviet Union. How does law work in the Central Asian state and what work does law do in the Central Asian state? Right, so one, formalism, right here, the, 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 the um, Kazakh traditional robes. Um, there's been an, an embrace of formalism. So all of these systems are every bit as formalist as the system they succeeded to. So they've carried on this robust tradition of Soviet legal formalism and its sophistication, right? These are all, I mean, I, the, 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 the Soviet Union was a very legally sophisticated place. And there was a lot of legal nous about, and there was a lot of, you know, um, lawyerly capacity. And there were a lot of lawyers in the Central Asian states while they didn't, you know, in, in some sense they were deprived of the central resources. Nonetheless, um, they 
had a lot of lawyers and they had a lot of legal talent and uh, for, for interesting reasons. So I, you know, Kazakhstan had a very famous tradition of civil law scholarship, largely as, as a result of wartime evacuation and exile. So a lot of the most prominent um, Soviet lawyers of the day, a number of whom were Jewish, wound up in Kazakhstan and Almaty during the war and stayed and sort of gave birth to this great Kazakh tradition of civil law scholarship. So the Kazakhs today have this very strong tradition of um, civil law scholarship, and they're really good lawyers. They're very sophisticated. So they, and so everybody basically embraced formalism, and they adopted, you know, as I showed you at the outset, um, perfectly ordinary, except for the super president, um, constitutional schemes. Um, so they're formalists. But they arose in a moment of globality. And this is the, that, that, that's the timing of that Caesarean operation by which they were all untimely ripped from the Soviet womb um, was hugely significant. It was the moment of the, 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 the cresting, if you like, of the wave of neoliberal governance and the Washington consensus and globalization, all of which had an extraordinary, posed extraordinary challenges and had extraordinary consequences for the nascent states, right? So there was the bandwagon on which everybody climbed. Um, all of the social, all of the, 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 the Central Asian states, as indeed all of the post-Soviet states, all of the transition states, were invited to climb on the neoliberal bandwagon, which they gleefully proceeded to do in one way or another, right? Um, and they exposed themselves to massive international assistance, programming of all sorts, right? So election monitors went everywhere. They were rapidly and comprehensively globalized and internationalized. All of these global actors descended on the scene in order to help these new states develop the necessary capacities and institutions in order to qualify for full-fledged global citizenship. And there was a lot you had to do at the end of the 80s, which you didn't have to do earlier. Right? Join the WTO, join the international financial institutions, et cetera, et cetera, adopt neoliberal policies. That was globalization. So you got OSCE monitors all over the place in your face. So you had internationals in your face, right? That was a function of this fateful moment um, of the appearance of the Central Asian states, right? Diplomacy, oil diplomacy, natural resource diplomacy, um, international mediation, right? So the Tajik civil war was settled by virtue of comprehensive international sponsorship and mediation. So you now had international peacekeeping operations, peacemaking and then peacekeeping. So once again, you had, you know, now you had internationals all over the place. You had, um, you, you had the OSCE, um, you had the UN, right? And this was all entirely novel for these places. And you had rule of law. Uh, legal assistance, legal reform assistance, or legal adjustment assistance, as it was universal and massively funded, and everybody got legal technical assistance. And before I go any further, let me make a disclaimer and um, confess that I was an advisor on a number of these programs, the World Bank, among, among others, and Kazakhstan, elsewhere, um, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, the Asian Development Bank. So I did the circuit right, as a legal reform advisor, and I've been atoning for my sins ever since, which I consider this lecture a significant part. Right? So um, basically, you had to um, adopt the latest and the best, international best practice in every area of the law, right? commercial law, criminal law, et cetera, constitutional law. And you got the benefit of, of, of all sorts of international assistance and expertise. Um, so you were going to be helped along. And the way forward was clear. And a lot of this was very prescriptive. I mean, there was only one way to do company law, and the World Bank was there to tell you how to do it. Um, right, so, so here's a criminal law conference in Tashkent relatively recently. Um, and this sort of thing was very standard and continues to be very standard. There was a massive amount of resources thrown at this. Um, so what this meant was that law at this point was now globalized. It could only be understood and constitutionalism was globalized. And indeed, adapting a, adopting 
a, an up-to-date modern, thoroughly modern constitution was part of this process of joining um, the global community, the international community. Now, for the leaderships themselves, of course, this was convenient because law was a tool of decompression in the process of social transformation. And indeed, Gorbachev had used it that way. Pietistroika was a gradual process, and the idea was to bring in changes one after the, to the other to decompress the Soviet system, the command administrative system, gradually. Right, so initially, they experimented with leasing, but ownership remained in state hands, and you would be leased state enterprise. It was sort of a recapitulation of NEP. And then they, you know, at the, in the very last year of the Soviet Union, was published the guidelines on, on, on the shift to a market economy. But the whole idea was that law would control this process. And indeed, that's the idiom that Central Asian leaders had used. And if indeed, you can consider that what happened after the transition as an example of explosive decompression rather than controlled decompression. But the Central Asian leaders themselves all said, well, we're doing this gradually. We can't have democracy overnight. We need this period of, 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 of careful. We're going to open political space gradually, and we're going to do it through law. And that's why we're bringing in constitutional changes gradually. That's why Uzbekistan in 2011 notionally liberalized its political its constitutional arrangements. Right? Now, of course, um, law remained an instrument of governance, an instrument of the networks. As I said, the networks governed through law, they governed through the Constitution, and they were in an enviable position because they not only governed through law, but they were the authors of the law they governed through. So they set the system up. So these, the Central Asian states were consolidated and constitutionalized as networked states. They didn't get networked, they didn't get privatized. This promiscuous mix of the private and the public was an aspect of their very coming to be as states, of their very develop development as states, of their identity as states. Um, now, th this operates at all scales, from the constitutional scale to the micro scale, where changes to particular pieces of legislation may have particular benefits to members of the network. So it might be more apt to think of surgical tools than carpenter's tools. Um, but if you want to push the metaphor further, um, you need to think of them in terms of technology. This is, by the way, for those who don't qu immediately get it, is not just a screwdriver. It's a sonic screwdriver used by Doctor Who. who is a, anybody who is not familiar with Doctor Who, I'll tell you about Doctor Who later. Uh, but he's a time lord, and he's got this special gizmo which opens doors and does a lot of other things. But the point is, it's a complicated piece of kit, and you're never sure exactly what's going to do. And that's the nature of the law, because you're never sure exactly what it's going to do, and it might not give you the results you anticipate. So there's always a wager involved, right? You're always playing poker when you work through the law, and that's part of the commitment to law in the first place. That's what you surrender when you agree to be, at least notionally, a legalistic state. Right? That's what the Soviets surrendered. It makes life much more difficult. It's part of the high maintenance if you need to work through law all the time. Okay? And if you may need to make sure that everything is scrupulously documented and effected by duly authorized law. So when you make a change in, in the law, you essentially lay a wager because you're not certain how it's going to turn out. And if you shift the mix of seats in parliament, you're not necessarily certain that that's going to redound to your advantage. All you can do is apply all of your energies to try to ensure the result that you desire. So if, I'm sure some of you are familiar with the term political technology, right, which was um, put forward to, to account for the system that's arisen in Russia, whereby the state in, invests enormous resources in ensuring the, 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 the outcome of elections. Um, in, Kazakhstan and the other Central Asian states, you can think of constitutional technology as well. There's an enormous investment in constitutional change in order to get, in order to mold the system nearer to the heart's desire and um, in order to conform it more closely to network desires or network ideas or network outcomes. Now, because networks are a dynamic system, 
uh, because patronal systems are constantly in flux as people are jockeying for position, interests change and network interests change and therefore networks will need to rejig and re-engineer the constitutional framework from time to time. And that's certainly the story of Kyrgyzstan. But any legal change is a wager. You're wielding a sonic screwdriver and you're never sure what you're going to get. Now another way to change the metaphor right, of, of thinking about constitutional systems and their relation to Central Asian states is in terms of costume. Okay, so um, I, 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 given the nature of globality and what's expected of global citizens, this is your sort of ticket to, this is your, your costume, your formal dress for attendance at international community functions, right? You gotta get, you, you, you have to get uh, dressed up like this, dressed to the nines in order to be deemed a fully paid up member of the international community. But it's a costume in another respect too, right? So here's Tony Stark's other suit, right? And this is a power suit, okay? Again, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Iron Man, I'm happy to give you a, a, a brief tutorial after the class. Okay, but uh, Iron Man flies around in this thing and it allows him to do all sorts of things, okay? And that's what a constitutional system does for the network. The network wears the constitutional system as a power suit and its own nervous system is integrated into the circuitry of the power suit just the way Tony Stark's nervous system is integrated into the circuitry of his power suit, right? So it allows you to do all sorts of things because you're the flying around and you're zapping people because you, you are the constitutional, you are the constitutional system, you embody it. But it also constrains you. There are certain things that you can't do. So it's simultaneously enabling and constraining. Now, at the end of the day then, what is the network? Okay, is it the res publica, the public thing, right? In, the good old Roman way, right? The senatus populusque Romanus, the Senate and the people of Rome, right? The Roman idea of the state. Or is it cosa nostra, our thing? Is it the public thing or is it our thing? Right, well, the, um, so you know, what, 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 what Rome gave us the Respublica and Sicily gave us the cosa nostra, so. Um, the, the point here is that it's impossible to say it's simultaneously the res publica and the cosa nostra. It's simultaneously the public thing and our thing. Um, and performativity is essential to it, right? Now, obviously, constitutions are performative in the sense that constitutions give you a script, like a musical score, and you have to act it or perform it. But there's a way in which, and indeed the functioning of the constitutional system is performative in that way. Um, but co the, the Central Asian constitutional systems are performative in a ritualistic, theatrical way, in a spectacular way. They are spectacles, and this, this uh, parade of the Kyrgyz, this, this, is, this is part of um, Bakiyev's celebration of his revolution in 2005. Um, I, uh, Rosa Altunbayeva did not have a similar thing after Bakiyev was thrown out, but this is Bakiyev's celebration of the, you know, the, the ouster of Bakiyev and the, the, the you know, the, vindication and validation of constitutional principles. So here's the Kyrgyz constitution being paraded around in effigy, right? Here's constitution day in Kazakhstan. Um, so the constitution itself has been fetishized. It's made an object of veneration and constitution day is a, is a big deal. It's effectively independence day. It's interesting in the States, it's the, you know, the, the date that people celebrate as the date of formal withdrawal, the declaration of independence, not the date of the constitution, which doesn't come for another, you know, however, you know, 11 years. Um, but the constitution itself here is fetishized. And people, you know, carry around these grand effigies of it. And you can think of the constitutional system itself as in a way reflecting the perpetuation, the carryover of Yurchak's performativity, late Soviet performativity. So the constitutional court council, which in Kazakhstan, which actually functions like the French constitutional council, um, is very sophisticated, but turns out invariably outcomes which are favorable to the authorities, right? I, I mean, in a very loyally sophisticated way, so much so that you can think of the, the, their activity as performative. It's more declaratory. It's not 
what the Constitution says. It's not the vindication of some particular constitutional value so much as it is the constant valorization and vindication of the Constitution itself and the constitutional system. And that goes for voting as well, right? So he was voting in the last Tajik election. So plebiscites, referenda, are a form of citizen participation in the constitutional process, which means nothing as far as content because all you could get to do is to say yes or no to sometimes a series of enormously complex constitutional changes which have been calculated for by network actors on the basis of their benefit to the network and which nobody else who hadn't been in the working groups is po can possibly in a relation, in a position to fathom and understand. Nonetheless, you're presented with this and you have to say yes or no. Um, and you say yes or no the same way you dropped your vote in the Soviet ballot box because it's a demonstration of your citizenship. It's a performance. It's a state effect. And indeed, much of this is a matter of what Timothy Mitchell called state effects. The way in which states are manifested. So rather than ask what a state is, um, ask how a state manifests itself. And the state effects of the Soviet Union were largely performative. All of these ritual performances, the Komsomol, the voting in the Supreme Soviet. Similarly, the Central Asian states exercise state effects of which the fetishization of the Constitution is one. My colleague John Heathershaw has come up with the term global performance state in reference Tajik, to, to, to Tajikistan um, to demonstrate the kind of state response and its significance in a globalized context. That these states are basically required to um, perform a particular global repertoire that they're handed by um, global institutions, by state institutions. They have to bring in a water resources law because the, uh, the World Bank is flogging that. And they do that and it's enacted and there's a ceremony. But the significance is largely declaratory, ceremonial, performative. It's an effect. But it's an, it's an effect by which the state manifests itself. So even weak states will invest a lot in state effects. Um, and indeed can be calculated to do so because it's a way of compensating for their general weakness and dysfunctionality. Now, because the law is a two-edged sword, a space for contestation is invariably created. And just as Yeltsin used the Soviet forms in order to wreak revenge on the Soviet system, so the available forms for contestation can be used in order to change and alter the system. There's no more glaring instance of that than Kyrgyzstan, um, which has the only non-presidential system. It's a semi-presidential system where the prime minister and the president respond to separate mandates like the French system. It's actually much more like the French system than the Kazakh system, which is supposed to be modeled after the French Fifth Republic. And, and Kyrgyzstan has always been the most boisterous and plural of the republics. Um, and in large part, that's due to the space that's afforded constitutionally. Now, I, I don't want everybody to you know, jump up and down and celebrate the, the, the Kyrgyz as effectively the, the roundheads, the, re the Republicans in the English Civil War who fought the monarch. Although it's sort of easy to see them that way as you know, Kyrgyz roundheads. Um, because you have to bear in mind that, the, that if you accept Hale's argument about the, 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 the durability of paternalism as a system, this is... This, this shift in Kyrgyzstan from presidential to parliamentary authority doesn't change the networks. It doesn't do away with the networks. It just changes a single pyramid network from, to a multiple pyramid network. All right, this is my last slide. And I, um, I, I want to close by, by, by invoking here um, the empty place of power and, 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 and a bit of democratic theory, which I'll treat you to. This is Claude Lefaux, one of the great um, French political thinkers of the last century who pose the idea of democracy as a unique system where the p place of power is kept empty. And his idea was that every post-medieval political system has to contend with the residue of the theological political. That political power historically in medieval times is always theologically invested. Um, there was always a symbolic order which mediated politics and political authority and that never changed. But what, what democ democracy purported to do is to leave the seat of power empty. So it's symbolically present, 
but not occupied. There is no monarch. There is only a representative of the sovereign who is the people. Why do I bring this up here? Because uh, you can understand networks as, well, that's just you know, being um, hard-nosed and realistic about the ubiquity of politics and that politics is constitutional and polit constitutional politics are every bit as nasty and tumultuous and combative as any other sort. Um, so there's nothing new about network governance. It's, you know, it, 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 it's to be expected. Um, I want to argue and, and, and leave you on this note, um, by contrast, that networks are deeply subversive of the theory of democracy because, precisely because they occupy the empty seat of power. And they not only manipulate the constitutional set, uh, system, but they set it up in the first place. It's their system. Now, it remains to be seen what happens. I mean, it remains to be seen how these constitutional de systems develop further. But at this juncture, it's too close to call. And certainly after 25 years, network-based governance and performativity, which you can understand now as a significant hangover or legacy from the Soviet period, are, um, re remain very robust and strong. And I have no idea, and I don't want to predict because I don't think, I think you, get, you, 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 you lose out. That's, that's the, a bad kind of wager. That's an academic wager, is making predictions. And I have no idea how this is going to play out, particularly in light of the contemporary events in Kazakhstan. I mean, it would flatter me to suppose that we would witness another revenge of the forms, that people would use the constitutional forms in order to overcome the nature of the patronal system. But stay posted. And thank you for your attention. Thank you.